When most believers of the message think of William Branham, they think of the prophet. Believers of the message are convinced to believe that William Branham is Elijah from the Old Testament, returning in modern times. When most believers of the message think about the prophet, they think about the sermons and the healing lines. Since William Branham's death in 1965, he has been immortalized through over a thousand recorded sermons and transcripts that are distributed to all parts of the globe by Branham's two sons and their nonprofit organization, Voice of God Recordings. Believers of William Branham think of him often, painting pictures in their minds that were created mostly from the details and history that was created for Branham's stage persona. But the personality given to the prophet, using only his words, is far from accurate. My family remembers a much different person. I grew up with the stories of a laughing, joking man. According to the stories told by my grandfather, father, aunts, and uncles, William Branham was a much different man than his stage persona. My family described William Branham as a man that was full of fun, often pulling pranks to make others laugh. I can remember the excitement in their eyes and the emotion that filled the air when they told and retold the stories more than I can remember the details of the stories themselves. William Branham held a very special place in each of their hearts, and most of my family was unaware of the very sinister things that went on behind the scenes. My grandfather was a close friend of William Branham. My aunts and uncles grew up with Branham's sons and daughters. They remember what the family was like in the early years, long before ankle-length skirts were enforced for women and before shorts were forbidden for men. They had photographs of William Branham and his family posing for the camera, wearing outfits that would later be forbidden by virtually every preacher in the religious cult called The Message. William Branham's son wore shorts, as did William Branham. Both posed for photographs in their shorts, even though shorts were condemned by the stage persona. William Branham's daughters wore skirts above the knees, which would have caused them to be labeled as prostitutes by every message pastor that I had heard. At least one church I had visited forced a young woman out of church for wearing a scandal skirt, a skirt with a slit in the back that exposed part of her upper calves. Men and women who were close to the prophet lived by his actions, not by his words. Men and women who knew William Branham only by the stage persona presented on the recordings lived their lives by his words and not by his actions. I always knew that the message that I raised my children in was different from the message that my grandfather raised his in. I wasn't aware, however, of how much it had changed before my grandfather joined, or the tactics used to grow and spread the message. When I discovered the testimony of the son of Raymond A. Hawes, something unusual caught my eye. When William Branham was teaching the latter rain theology to those at the Sharon Orphanage, it included metaphysics. Hawes claimed that Branham could move objects in the air. I remembered a story I heard on the very first sermon that we had access to hear. One person stood before William Branham, claiming not to believe. Suddenly, William Branham asked everyone in the room to turn their backs to him. With their backs turned, Branham claimed that he could move a bracelet in the air with his mind. Just when it got interesting, the tape was spliced, and I was unable to hear the rest of the story. It was missing from both the recording and the transcript. Then, in an obviously different recording, his voice said, I'll take any cross-eyed child you've got in this meeting. You bring it up here, and without even praying for it, just let me look at it straight in the eyes like that, and I'll make its eyes go straight. I wanted to hear what the people said when they turned back around. I also wanted to hear if anyone said, hey, why did you have us turn our backs? I wanted to see what happened. Learning that his brother Howard toured with him while still running a bar back in Jeffersonville, I knew that this was most certainly a favorite bar trick. Whether anyone in the room turned to see what happened or not, 
The strategy worked. Branham's unusual doctrine had made an impact on those at the Sharon Orphanage, and the latter rain revival quickly started to spread from North Battleford. The Voice of Healing revival followed closely on its heels, making nearly impossible to distinguish the two. Men from both camps were cross-pollinating, and many of them truly felt as if both groups were one and the same. George Warnock started teaching Branham's Manifest Sons of God doctrine, and it began to propagate into both revivals. As a close associate of Ern Baxter, who worked so closely with William Branham that the revivals became known as the Baxter-Branham campaigns, George Warnock would have been a respected figure. When he taught Branham's Manifest Sons of God theology, listeners would have assumed that other participants in the revival believed the same theology. Before long, the Voice of Healing revival and the Latter Rain Revival became indistinguishable. Many evangelists were part of both Latter Rain and Voice of Healing. I found an article in the March 2018 issue of The Canadian Mantle, a magazine promoting the Independent Assemblies of God, or IAOG. The IAOG was organized in 1918 as the Scandinavian Assemblies of God in the United States of America. It was established by Rev. A. W. Rasmussen. Rasmussen was a name that I was very familiar with in the message. William Branham often spoke with or of Brother Rasmussen and Brother Bose from the platform and referred to both men as not only business associates but close friends. Page 5 of the magazine had an article that listed the timeline of events in Latter Rain, and according to this list, A.W. Rasmussen invited George Houghton to speak at the IAOG convention after the revivals at the Sharon Orphanage. Rasmussen described the men of the Battleford Revival as if they were heroes. Both the Houghton brothers and Hunt were invited to speak concerning their formula for revival. These meetings were held each day and the two Houghtons split to cover more ground. Before long, William Branham's name was familiar throughout the IAOG. I suddenly wanted to learn more about Brother Rasmussen, the Independent Assemblies of God, and the New Order of the Latter Rain. A. W. Rasmussen was, according to William Branham, a close friend and business associate. Rasmussen was one of the strongest supporters and promoters of William Branham and his message, at least during the time that Branham worked with members of the Latter Rain movement. Rasmussen continued to invite William Branham to speak or join events in which William Branham spoke for years to come. Rasmussen may have been new to William Branham's unusual doctrines, but he was no stranger to Pentecostalism or Christian fundamentalism. About the same time the Azusa Street Revival was exciting the early Pentecostals of 1906, Scandinavian Baptists broke out in revival in Chicago. As a result, many of the Scandinavian churches joined the Pentecostal faith. Among those who joined was Rev. A. W. Rasmussen. In 1908, Rasmussen founded the Independent Assemblies of God IAOG, under the title Scandinavian Assemblies of God, which joined the independent Pentecostal churches in 1935. For about five years, he ran the organization from Brooklyn, New York, holding two services, one in a Scandinavian language and one in English, and working with revivalists from coast to coast. As a result, Rasmussen became well-connected in Pentecostal circles. In November of 1941, Rasmussen took a leadership position in Chicago's Philadelphia Church. It was the same church that organized William Branham's Chicago campaign, and the same group that would later host Jim Jones' Latter Rain revivals. From Chicago, Rasmussen would continue to unify the IAOG while working with the Canadian groups. In 1945, Rasmussen relocated to Edmonton, Alberta and started the Edmonton Gospel Temple. Interestingly, the Edmonton Gospel Temple provided a Masonic Temple Club Room, further connecting Branham and his associates to the Masonic Order, a subject I was very interested in. While Rasmussen worked in Edmonton, Joseph Matson Bose took his place in Chicago at the Philadelphia Church. 
Church directories in Chicago, however, continued to list Rasmussen as pastor. Branham's tour through Canada in 1947 gave birth to the Latter Rain Movement at the Sharon Orphanage in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. William Branham was both a catalyst and a supporter. Though he would later distance himself from the main branch of Latter Rain, Branham would continue to work closely with Rasmussen and Bose while teaching specific doctrines from the Manifest Sons of God subsect of Latter Rain and the Latter Rain Movement. Those who did not know the difference would have mistakenly suspected that William Branham was teaching the same Latter Rain version that was being taught in the sect originating from the Sharon Orphanage. But those in that particular sect, not its branches, would have disagreed. William Branham himself spoke about the main branch of Latter Rain and spoke about it as if it were old news. The revival at the Sharon Orphanage had made an impact on Rasmussen and his multiple congregations. As the revival began to spread, Rasmussen became instrumental in propagating it throughout the United States. On many occasions, Rasmussen would hold Latter Rain revivals in Edmonton one week, then continue them with Joseph Matson Bose in Chicago the next. He'd return to Edmonton to tell the events that happened in Chicago's Latter Rain revivals. Not everyone agreed with the Latter Rain movement, however, and it would eventually split Pentecostalism in half. Church leaders began to realize the dangerous way in which Latter Rain leaders were given authority. The Assemblies of God met in Seattle, Washington to halt the danger, at which time the extremist views presented by ministers in the new order of Latter Rain were rejected. After the resolution was passed, Rasmussen separated his independent Assemblies of God from the main branch of the Assemblies and became fully dedicated to spreading the Latter Rain version of William Branham's message. <laughs>